Hello and welcome to GameSack. This time around we're going to do something pretty different. In fact, what we're going to do is take one game and pit it against another game and pick a winner. It's pretty weird. Yeah, it's kind of weird, but some of these games are going to be rivalries from back in the day. Others, not so much, but... Uh, yeah, it's basically exactly <clears throat> like our random battle episodes, only completely different. Completely different. Anyway, if you're curious how this works, well, here's how. Shinobi on the Sega Master System versus Ninja Gaiden on the NES. Which console has the better showcase ninja game? If you were alive and cognizant back when the NES and Master System were the hot consoles, you may remember the battle over which system had the best ninja game. This was important because ninjas were super cool back then. Hell, I say they're still cool now. Both games started out as arcade games. I actually own the Shinobi Arcade PCB here and I absolutely love it. It goes without saying that I was really looking forward to this coming home to the Sega Master System as that was the only console I had. Ninja Gaiden also had an arcade game, but the NES version is radically different. If we're going to limit the discussion to arcade games, Shinobi's going to win every time. But this is the Master System game versus the NES game that we're talking about here. Nothing else. And Shinobi came home first in 1988. While it remained faithful to the arcade and stage design, they did change up a few things. Gone are the one-hit deaths, and you now have a life bar. You get power-ups when you rescue the hostages, and it can take several stages to get fully powered up. You also no longer need to rescue all the hostages to complete a stage. You can completely ignore them if you're some kind of heartless bastard. You now have to earn your ninja magic in the bonus stages. If you're successful, you can only use your ninja magic after you've defeated a prerequisite amount of enemies on that stage. The magic itself is usually nothing very special and you can't use it on bosses. Control-wise, the game remained pretty much the same. It's still a very fun game, and even though you have a life bar, it's definitely pretty challenging. If you die, you lose all of your power-ups, and who doesn't enjoy that? The visuals are done really well, and the music is good, if not a bit repetitive. There's an FM soundtrack on this cartridge, and honestly, it sounds way better than the generic PSG version. Now, you might think this is cheating because at the time we had no way to access the FM music in the US, but it is present on the cartridge, so it counts. And you might also be thinking, since the NES has a version of Shinobi, then why bother with the Master System one? Well, the NES Shinobi is just a half-assed port, to put it politely, of the Master System version. Nobody takes it seriously, and neither should you. Likewise, if you're not in the US, you might be thinking, well, Ninja Gaiden's on the Master System and it's way better than the NES version. This is a battle between Shinobi on the Master System and Ninja Gaiden on the NES only. Ninja Gaiden on the NES is a completely different game from Shinobi. You control Ryu Hayabusa, and this is one of the first console games with extensive cutscenes fleshing out the story. And believe it or not, this was a really big deal back then. The gameplay is pretty fast, and it suffers from infinitely generating enemies. You have to keep moving no matter what, otherwise you'll never get anywhere. The game is also known for being pretty tough in the upper levels, and thankfully it has unlimited continues. You also stick to walls, and to be honest, I never really like this play mechanic. It makes the game feel very stiff, like you're trapped on flypaper. You have ninja magic that you get during a stage, and these are mostly offensive powers that kill enemies. Some are even defensive like this fire wheel here, but enemies still die when they touch it. The graphics are pretty good, though grainier than Shinobi. And the music is also very well done. There's lots of catchy tunes, and most of them are fairly memorable. It's a tough game for me, and I've never personally beaten it, and it can be quite frustrating at times. I mean, there's lots of cheap deaths here. Shinobi versus Ninja Gaiden. Winner, Ninja Gaiden. I bet you expected me to pick Shinobi, didn't you? Well, it's true, I do have much more nostalgia for Shinobi, and I do prefer playing that one, but Ninja Gaiden really gives the player more for their money. 
and despite the cheapness in Ninja Gaiden's design, you can overcome it if you keep at it. Both games are must-haves for their respective systems, but there's just so much more to Ninja Gaiden that the Master System version of Shinobi can't really compare. Rad Racer on the NES versus Outrun on the Sega Master System. Which is the best 8-bit racing game? Let's take a look at Rad Racer first. This arcade-style racer lets you choose between a Ferrari 328 and an F1 car as your ride of choice. Both cars control and feel the same while driving, so it's mostly just aesthetics when picking. The only real difference between the two is when racing with the 328, your opponents are in different cars, and when you're racing in the F1, your opponents are all F1 cars. There's eight courses for you to race on, and each one is set up with checkpoints that you have to reach within a time limit. One really interesting and helpful feature here is that if you don't reach a checkpoint when time runs out, you still control your car as it slows down to a stop. If you do reach a checkpoint while slowing down, you're back in the race, baby, and the timer resets for the next segment. I like this feature and it saved me many times. Your car is equipped with an infinite turbo that you can kick in once your car reaches 100 kilometers per hour. The courses are designed really well, but you'll have to brake quite a bit to make some of the turns. If you don't brake, you'll crash and this is bad. Your car takes an average of 4 seconds to reset itself in the middle of the highway before you can race again. This might not seem like a lot, but it really is, so you know, just don't crash. The game controls well, and most of the time it's really fun to weave in and out of traffic. The background graphics are pretty good here, and I like how there's multiple layers of scrolling. The game does have three music tracks that you can switch to on the fly, and at first I thought they were just average. But the more I played, the more the music grew on me, and I've actually ended up humming the tunes well after I've turned the game off. Now let's take a look at OutRun. This arcade racing game got ported to just about every system that Sega released, but we're only looking at the Master System version here. Just like the arcade, this version doesn't have multiple courses like other racing games, it just has one big course. The beauty of it is that at each checkpoint you have an option to go left or right, and this will bring you to a new background to race through. There's a total of 15 different segments for you to enjoy, and since you can choose your path, your racing experience can be different every time. It's a brilliant idea that makes you want to play this game a lot. That is, if you can reach the checkpoints before time runs out. If you don't reach a checkpoint when the timer hits zero, then it's game over immediately. The game controls okay, but to me it's a bit floaty. One real problem that I had is that when you finish a long, tight corner, if you're still pushing the directional pad in that direction, you go flying across the highway as the track straightens out. This sucked, and I haven't had this problem with any of the other versions, just the Master System one. The game boasts three music tracks to listen to, and all of them are very enjoyable. A bonus here is that you have the ability to listen to the PSG sound or the FM sound if you have a Master System or Powerbase converter with the right hardware. They both have their charm, but I think I prefer the FM sound. Rad Racer versus Outrun! Winner, Rad Racer! I felt that the game controlled really well and runs much smoother than Outrun. For example, coming over hills in Rad Racer wasn't a problem as I felt in control most of the time. Whereas coming over hills in Outrun, I felt like I was going to crash at any second. It's almost seizure inducing watching graphics pop up on screen and having no idea if the track was going to turn or go straight. The background graphics in Rad Racer are much more attractive than what you see in Outrun. For example, I really like when you come over the crest of a hill in San Francisco and the city comes into view. That's a really nice touch. As you know, I'm a huge fan of the Outrun series, but this version has issues and Rad Racer is the better game. It makes me wonder how my life in gaming would be if there was a Super Rad Racer or a Rad Racer U. I can only dream. Space Harrier on the Master System versus 3D World Runner on the NES. Which is the better forward scrolling game featuring a checkerboard floor? I loved Space Harrier in the arcades and it was one of the games that convinced me to get a Master System over the NES. And this was the first game I purchased when I got my system and I never regretted it. Granted, everything is pretty much a far cry from the arcade game. 
The goal in this one is to run and fly forward, shoot the enemies, and don't touch anything. The concept is pretty damn simple. You've got 18 stages to make it through. Can you do it? The graphics of the enemies are all really, really big and detailed. Bigger than the arcade version, even. It may surprise you that the only sprites in this game are Space Harrier himself and his bullets. Everything else in the game is just the background being redrawn again and again and again. This helps eliminate flicker completely, but comes at the cost of some pretty choppy motion and some blocky stuff around the graphics. But once you get used to it, it's all pretty manageable. At the end of each stage, of course, there's a cool boss to fight, and some of them look pretty badass. Remember that this was an early game for the system. While the graphics have all been completely redrawn, the enemy patterns are all pretty much exactly the same as the arcade game. In fact, I was able to beat the arcade by practicing on this version. The music is awesome as well. There's one large, well-composed theme that plays throughout the game, and different stages play different parts of it. The game even has real voices provided by real voice actors. Wow, it's almost like someone is sitting next to you saying, Get ready. This was also the very first game that I ever beat. The 3D Battles of World Runner was the closest competitor to Space Harrier on the NES. I don't know about you, but I always just called the game World Runner 3D. In this one, you're mostly stuck running along the ground. You have a jump button and you need to jump over large chasms which are all over the place for no discernible reason. You can increase or decrease your speed by pressing up or down and this plays a big role in timing your jumps. Normally you can't shoot, but you can run into certain pillars to collect items. That has gotta hurt. These items will do different things like let you shoot for a little bit, give you temporary invincibility, or hell, even kill you, so watch out. At the end of each long ass stage, you'll fight a boss. And this is done space harrier style, and it's usually pretty easy. The game gets a bit more complex as you progress, as you really need to time your jumps over the chasms to land on the jump springs. The graphics are basic, but they're also really, really smooth. There's no choppy motion anywhere, and the floor even scrolls left and right like the space harrier arcade machine. Even the sprites grow really smoothly, though they don't get very big. In fact, everything in this game is pretty small. I've got to admit that I was kind of jealous of this game back in the day because it was doing things that I felt the Master System version of Space Harrier should be doing, like the smooth, multi-directional scrolling floor and background graphics on the horizon. Come on, Sega, why couldn't you do these things? You can also enable the 3D mode by pressing the select button, but it's not very special. Watch our ancient 8-bit 3D games episode for more on the 3D aspect. The music, unfortunately, can best be described as stupid. It's too cheerful and honestly it's kind of annoying. I'm sure the composer of this drivel never went on to do anything noteworthy and quickly faded into obscurity. Good. No second chances for you. Space Harrier versus World Runner! Winner! Space Harrier! Seriously, what did you expect? Space Harrier just floors World Runner despite the few advantages the latter may have here and there. I honestly can't imagine any parallel universe where Space Harrier loses this battle. The music alone makes World Runner lose as it's geared towards young children. Space Harrier is also much more fun to play and you're not doing dumb things like jumping over black chasms. Long live Space Harrier. I keep blasting bushes and them trees be trying to flee. flee. Then I trip over the bushes and them trees be killing me. me. I keep pushing buttons, but all they do is shoot. I, I get the loot, my points be going through the roof. That wildlife gets the boot. These fools don't faze me. I don't die till level 50. When them crazy two robots go blasting the gas, a rat attack, a rat attack. I don't take no flack from these robots, man, for real. I have to bust out with some crazy flying skills. Crazy flying skills. I dodge left, I dodge right, oh man! Alright, here we are halfway through this thing, and by now you guys are getting a good example of what we're trying to do here, and the winners that we're picking between these battles. And the most important thing, you're still watching. Yes. That is good. Huge. Anyway, we've got another battle coming up. You've, mm -hmm. you got your you know, pitting Mario against something, but you can't take 
Mario, the series, and pitted against another series. And well, let, let, let's see what you've got going on here. Yeah, you don't don't jump to conclusions. It's going to be different than you think. Alex Kidd in Miracle World versus Super Mario Brothers. Which is the better game starring the system mascot? Mario was a juggernaut for Nintendo, selling systems left and right and owning the home console market. If you've been dead for the past 30 years, then let me tell you about this game. You play as Mario, and you're on a quest to save the princess from King Koopa, aka Bowser, so she can help the people of the Mushroom Kingdom. Along the way, Mario runs, jumps, and kills enemies to make it to the goal of each stage. At first, he feels like he controls very sluggish, but once you play the game a few thousand times, then you won't even notice it at all. Each world has four sublevels, with the fourth one ending in a very exciting boss fight with a Bowser impersonator. The Mushroom Kingdom has a small assortment of levels from normal platforming areas above and below ground to levels with lots of swimming. The game is pleasing in the graphics department and has some really good music to round things out. Sega couldn't get a foothold in the US market and decided that they needed a Mario killer. They came up with Alex Kidd in Miracle World. This one has you controlling Alex through 11 worlds. At first he feels like he controls a bit floaty and slippery, but with some practice you'll get the hang of it. Alex can punch blocks which hold all types of goodies from rings to money. But not all blocks are good and there are some blocks that can hurt you. Like this skull block when hit will give Alex the jitters and he'll freeze in place for a few seconds. The question mark box can hold a ghost that'll chase Alex around and kill him if he gets touched. Luckily, all you have to do is run off screen to get rid of this spooky menace. Collecting money is beneficial because you can visit a shop and buy useful items to help you through your quest. Instead of fighting a boss at the end of some levels, you play a game of Jonkin, or as I know, rock, paper, scissors. If you win, you move on to the next level, and if you lose, then you die. <laughs> it doesn't seem fair, does it? Risking your life for a game of chance? Yes, there are patterns to win, but if you don't know them, it can be insanely annoying. The game is loaded with colorful graphics and some really catchy music. Alex Kidd in Miracle World versus Super Mario Brothers. Winner, Super Mario Brothers! In the end, I do enjoy both games, but there's a lot more subtle charm than meets the eye with Mario. This game opened up my eyes to what gaming could be about. Little things like hidden boxes that hold one-ups, finding that random pipe to go down so you can get secret hidden coins, and who can forget the first time they found the secret warp pipes, and the extra detail of getting fireworks at the end of a level if you jump on the flag with the timer ending in a 1, 3, or 6. These little details really cemented this game as something special. Plus, Alex Kidd had those stupid Junkin bosses that doesn't do anything to help that game. Sure, Japan loves that stuff to death, but nobody else does. I mean, come on! If Alex Kidd in Miracle World had more bosses like this insane giant beast instead, it would have been much better. Mario Brothers is definitely the better game in this case. <laughs> Thunder Force 3 on the Genesis versus Gradius 3 on the Super Nintendo. Which is the best early horizontal shooter representing the third entry in their respective series? I was a big fan of Thunder Force 2, so I eagerly awaited the release of Part 3. And I got the Japanese version for my birthday one year, and I still have it. In fact, it's what I'm playing right now. The story doesn't matter very much, you're just trying to destroy the Orn base who has decided to eradicate all human life in the galaxy. No biggie. You're allowed to pick your starting stage. As you play, you'll get different weapons, all of which have their uses. You can cycle through any of the weapons that you've collected at any time with a tap of the C button. Button B fires your shot, while button A adjusts your speed to one of four different settings at any time. If you die, you respawn right there, minus the weapon that you were using and your rotating claws. If you're good at this game like I am, it's really easy to rack up the extra lives, making the entire thing a breeze. But keep in mind, I've been playing this one forever. The stages are all unique and they feature a lot of detail and color. The parallax scrolling is also excellent throughout and the wavy line scrolling effect was put to good use in the lava stage. Back when I got this game, this was the first time I'd ever seen an effect like this. And of course, it goes without saying that the music is outstanding.
Each and every stage without exception has some amazing music, though a couple of stages loop a bit more than I'd like. However, the quality of the voices is horrible. Overall, this one is really fun to play. Gradius 3 was released very early in the Super Nintendo's life. This one's based on an arcade game which I've never had a chance to play. As with all Gradius games, the power-up system relies on a bar at the bottom of the screen. As you collect power-up icons, the highlighted box advances one space. Once it gets to an item that you'd like, you press the button and you get that item. It's a good idea and it works well for the series. I generally like the laser, missile, options, and shield setup. You can choose which setup you like at the beginning of the game or even make your own based on all the available options. That's pretty cool. Each stage begins in space where you shoot down a bunch of enemies in order to power yourself up a bit. Then the music changes and the real part of the stage begins. As you'd expect, a boss encounter awaits you at the end of each stage. Overall, the game is pretty fun to play, except of course when you die. When that happens, you get set back a bit and lose every one of your power-ups, and sometimes there's not enough power icons to help you before a big boss fight. Another issue this game has is slowdown. The more powered up you are, the worse it is. It happens whenever you're firing your weapon. Some people say this is by design, but I don't think so. I mean, if it's by design, then why doesn't it slow down when I'm super underpowered? Honestly, I just think that Konami didn't know what the hell they were doing with the system yet. The magazines really ragged on this game back in the day for its slowdown, and it would be dumb to design it that way. I'm quite certain that they lost some sales as a result. Visually, the game is pretty sparse and there's not a whole lot going on, but it doesn't look unpleasant. The sound, though, is pretty good with some really clear voices. And the music is outstanding. It makes you feel very heroic at times, like you can almost do anything. Absolutely classic stuff here. Thunder Force 3 versus Gradius 3. Winner, Thunder Force 3! Thunder Force 3 really is the better game. It's a lot easier than Gradius 3, but that doesn't mean it's a lesser game. There's a ton more going on visually and the graphics are a lot better. Gameplay wise, I feel that Thunder Force 3 changed things for the better from part two in order to better engage the player, whereas Gradius 3 decided to stay trapped in its own formula. It's not a bad formula or anything, but if you've played any other Gradius game, then you've pretty much played this one. As far as the music goes, that is a much tougher choice. Thunder Force 3 has some really rock and high energy tunes, whereas Gradius 3 has more upbeat music. They are both quite exceptional. I think I'm going to have to give the edge to Thunder Force 3 as far as the music goes. So which of these two games do you prefer? Streets of Rage on the Genesis versus Final Fight on the Super Nintendo. Which is the better system selling beat em up? Let's start out with Streets of Rage. The whole city has been corrupted by a crime syndicate and even the police force is on their payroll. Three rogue cops decide to take matters into their own hands and try to clean up the streets while figuring out who is the head of the crime syndicate. In this one or two player game, you can pick from three different characters. They control similar enough, but they do have their own moves. Fighting is fast and very fun, even if you're fighting the same thugs again and again. There's not a lot of variety in the enemies and you fight the usual thugs, fat guys, whip-wielding winches, and yeah, a few more. You even get a special attack in the form of a backup police car. No matter where you are, a police car will drive up and launch an RPG that will do serious damage to everything on screen. How they got a police car on this boat is bewildering, but hell, I'm glad it's here. The levels are long and the graphics are great. There's a lot of nice variety on the stages that you fight on. The most notable part about this game is the soundtrack. That's right, Yuzo Koshiro has turned a fun game into an excellent game. It's amazing how a great soundtrack elevates your experience. Next we have Final Fight, which is a port from the arcade game. The whole city is being threatened by the Mad Gear game. The mayor, Mike Hager, has vowed to put a stop to the gang activities. 
The leader of the gang thinks otherwise and kidnaps the mayor's daughter. This doesn't sit well with Mayor Hager, so he takes his shirt off in protest. In this single player game, you can choose from two fighters, Mayor Hager or his daughter's boy toy Cody. Yes, the arcade game had Guy, a third fighter, but he was removed for this port. Cody is more of a brawler, while Hager is more into wrestling and throw moves. He's also really into wearing his pants high. Each player controls fine and is actually enjoyable to play. There's five areas to battle through and of course you'll fight the same guys over and over. This game is ridiculously hard and a lot of people you will fight will really piss you off because they'll always get in a hit before you. There's even times when you feel like you're stuck in a pattern of getting your ass kicked so you have to do a super move. This will get you out of being stuck but the penalty is that your life bar will deplete a bit because of this. Whose stupid idea was it to make your life bar go down just because you use a super move? There should be a separate bar just for super moves. Anyway, the levels have a bit of variety, but there's nothing really interesting going on in them. The characters, however, are large compared to Streets of Rage. There's even a bonus game in here where you get to smash a car. Don't worry, it belongs to a gang member, so you don't have to feel bad. As far as music goes, you get Capcom's 16-bit music, which consists of a lot of reverb and horrible instrument choices. Streets of Rage versus Final Fight! Winner, Streets of Rage! Oh, what a fierce competition this is, but we can only have one winner. Streets of Rage has so much more going for it than Final Fight. Firstly, you can play two players, whereas you're always lonely in Final Fight. Plus, Capcom removed Guy from the final game. Sure, they tried to make up for it with Final Fight Guy, but all this did was take out Cody as a playable character, and it's still just a single-player game. Streets of Rage has a better variety in backgrounds. I like the little touches like paper blowing in the wind, the shimmering reflection of buildings on the water, and even the two second rainstorms. And as I mentioned before, it has an amazing soundtrack by Yuzo Koshiro. Nothing makes you tense up more than hearing the intro music for boss fights. Oh man, I love that music. It kills me to admit Sega as the winner, but it has to be done sometimes and I gotta hold back my fanboy feelings. Yeah, of course you're gonna pit Alex Kidd versus Mario because you know if you pitted him against Sonic, Sonic would win. Oh well, I don't really know about that, but I only, I can't pit the first Mario against Sonic since they're two different generations. You know that is true, and maybe we should change up the rules on these type of episodes. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe we should have, you know, any game versus any other game. What do you guys think? You know, what games would you like to see fight each other and us pick a winner on? It could be anything like, you know, House of the Dead pinball versus. Uh, 720 degrees on the NES. You, you never know. <laughs> the, the, it's endless. The amount of combinations are good. Indeed. It's, <laughs> so let us know. And in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. I'm glad you've got that piece of crap here because we're gonna find out which system has the best built-in game. Okay, let's do it! The Sega Master System versus the Nintendo Entertainment System. Which console has the best built-in entertainment? When you power on the NES without a cartridge, you get a flashing screen that will keep flashing until you power off the console. When you power up the original Sega Master System without a game, you get this screen. By pressing up and both buttons, you get Snail Maze. In this one, you guide a snail to the goal in 12 different mazes. Snail Maze versus Flashing Screen! Winner! Nintendo's Flashing Screen! Well, come on, Joe. Nintendo is always better than Sega. I'd rather look at a flashing screen instead of playing any stupid Sega game. Sega's dumb. Just for no reason, they're just dumb. You are a true idiot, Dave.